1 o'clock Eastern, where I'm located here in Atlanta, Georgia. Good uh, morning, good afternoon, and uh, we have some 200 people from a variety of different uh, different time zones, and uh, for those of you who it's also appropriate to say good evening, I want to give you a warm welcome to all of our attendees to today's uh, webinar. Uh, the, the topic today is the Modern Data Warehouse, Critical Trends, Implementation Challenges, and Solution Approaches. My name is Larry Pearson, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Impetus, and I'll be your host and a co-presenter for today's session. Joining me today is also Vineet uh, Tayagi. Vineet has uh, close to 20 years of uh, IT industry experience, and the last nine years of those have been spent here at Impetus, where five years ago he was named head of labs and led a team of some uh, couple of hundred architects and technologists who serve as our technology radar in the corporation, who lead various R&D initiatives. And one year ago, as part of that, was also, also took on the title of Chief Technology Officer. Vineet may be a familiar name to uh, some of you from previous webinars. Uh, he's a very popular speaker at uh, industry conferences on topics like uh, the topic that we have here today and most recently uh, represented us on a panel uh, at while we were co-sponsors uh, of a Data Warehouse Modernization Checklist, which was uh, performed by uh, the TDWI uh, organization. Uh, so, so let's take a closer look now at, uh, at our topics uh, for today. Uh, you may have seen when you registered that you had the opportunity to sign up for the full webinar series. This is the first in a five-part series on the topic of data warehouse modernization. Today, in addition to introducing some of the major implementation challenges and critical trends that our uh, customers and prospects uh, experience today as they proceed down what we've come to call the EDW to BDW journey or enterprise data data warehouse to big data warehouse journey. We'll talk about the implication of that. And then lastly, we'll summarize what uh, uh, some of what we believe to be uh, best practices and solution approaches as we work with uh, large enterprises to implement uh, big data or the modern data warehouse. And then we'll summarize again at the end what will be covered in some of the other uh, webinar topics along with an opportunity, as I mentioned, to uh, give you, uh, uh, let you submit your questions and we'll answer as many of those as we can live and on the air today. Uh, you see here on the screen right now uh, some of the topics that we'll be covering. Some of these will be addressed uh, to a certain extent uh, beginning right today with uh, this part one of the webinar series. And some of the interesting questions that we're getting regularly asked by large enterprises is how do I implement a logical path for this journey into uh, accommodating big data in our data warehouse infrastructure environment of today? How do I ensure that the big data warehouse provides similar data security, governance, and data access to what I have today? And that will also be a topic we will address as we uh, proceed down through the series. Certainly open source has had a major impact on the uh, IT strategies that we put in place to address what uh, we've traditionally uh, called the three Vs or four Vs of big data and what today we're referring to as big data fast data, which has to do with real-time streaming analytics and g enabling anal advanced analytics to support real-time decision-making, new data, which has to do with uh, unstructured data in all of its uh, many forms, and also this fourth V, which some would refer to as veracity, veracity or true data, and that has to do with the ongoing challenge of uh, uh, leveraging data blending and other advanced analytical techniques actually at the point of ingestion to improve data quality, which is always a challenge uh, in the big data warehouse environment. So those are some of the things that we'll be talking about today, begin talking about today, and will certainly be addressed uh, at some point in, in detail by one or more of our webinar series. So if you look at some of the starting in here, looking at some of the current trends that are impacting us all today, some have coined this phrase, you know, the, the calling this the the age of data or the age of big data. In this case, we're referring, we're calling it the age of the millennium, the, the age of the millennial. 
And regardless of your ability to identify with the young lady that we see here <laughs> depicted on this screen, the fact of the matter is that all of us are impacted in one way or another by the notion of social, mobile, always on. Uh, I sit and I'm well north of uh, the, the demographic definition of millennial. But it's far more than just a social demographic, and in fact is a microcosm for the digitization of how business is being conducted today. And the fact of the matter is, whether you're in the B2C space or the B2B space, as we are, offering advanced technology solutions to enterprises, recent research shows that even in our environment, as much as 70% or more of the quote-unquote shopping or investigation or vetting uh, that enterprises do when they look even at complex technology solutions is done prior to them ever raising their hand and requesting to have a face-to-face -face meeting with an enterprise uh, sales executive. And it really has to do with exactly what's going on here, uh, and that's the digitization of how business is conducted. was first seen and uh, popularized in the big box brick-and-mortar channel with the onset of what today is uh, referred to as omni-channel but really affects all of us by these same kinds of things which we kind of look to the millennials as being second nature to them because they grew up in the midst of all of this. Well, I did not grow up in the midst of all of this. I'm well aware that every time I touch the remote, every keystroke is being captured. And uh, that's going into a profile of what my interests are, who I am, and particularly then in the e-commerce space. I would much rather today, if I'm going to buy a, a plane ticket, if I'm going to look for where to go to a movie, if I'm going to pick a restaurant or any of a number of different shopping, quote-unquote, decisions which I may, might make, I'd much rather do that very quickly on uh, my phone than I would have to do from some of the more traditional ways that we would guide that decision maker. And as I say, it's actually even affecting the way large enterprises go about vetting and selecting technology. Now, we've been an early adopter and a thought leader in this space since uh, Apache, Hadoop was, uh, Apache Hadoop was first introduced and before any of the distro vendors really were founded. Uh, and as a result, uh, we've been able to gain some important lessons learned that we'll be sharing today on this webinar and throughout the entire uh, webinar series. Uh, if you to look more uh, specifically then at the impact that some of these trends have on IT, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, there was a book called uh, Competing on Analytics that was published uh, all the way back in 2007 and in a shortly after by Tom, uh, written by Tom Davenport and published by the Harvard Business Review uh, uh, Press. Shortly after that, about that same time frame is when uh, leaders like uh, Google and Yahoo and others began to open source important technologies like Hadoop and MapReduce that we take for granted today. And really today, enterprises are very convinced of the opportunity that competing on analytics, that understanding how to completely leverage and even exploit the availability of all of these different data sources and to uh, drive uh, decision-making up to a deeper level of insight and a higher level of scale is absolutely fundamental to maintaining competitiveness. But the fact of the matter is we who are uh, uh, are challenged to do this in each of our companies are also told to find ways to do more with less. And the beauty of what's going on today in big data technologies is that we actually do have the opportunity to improve enterprise effectiveness, but also to improve enterprise efficiency by leveraging, leveraging uh, open source as a way to do that. In, in, in addition, uh, obviously, the other big drivers for uh, big data are the things that we see uh, talked about here um, that are fundamental objectives of what we're attempting to do as we optimize business processes, reduce operational costs, transform to do real-time decision-making, and this whole phrase, you know, customer 360-degree view has become second nature. But in the middle of that, you have, we have an additional challenge here in the whole area of maintaining security and data governance amidst the uh, popular uh, 
realization, even in places like the Internal Revenue Service, of some some data breaches and the importance of maintaining uh, protection over personally identifiable information, avoiding identity theft, and so forth. So it's a very challenging environment that we are in today as IT professionals, and uh, this uh, five-part series and some sharing of different th work that we've done will hopefully give you some great insights as to how best to do that. I'd like to turn things over now to uh, Vineet Tayagi to talk in some more details about this journey into the modern data warehouse. Vineet? Well, thank you, Larry. And thank you for all the uh, visitors uh, who are joining us for across the globe uh, from different time zones for this webinar. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from whichever uh, time zone you're joining in from. And thank you once again for listening into our webinar. So I you set the context of uh, what is the big data journey all about and why it's increasingly becoming important for enterprises to be having a big data strategy. And uh, what we realized working with uh, customers and when we started working with big data, specifically Hadoop-driven ecosystems in 2009 was that you know, while Hadoop is going to bring a lot of uh, capabilities uh, in terms of having ability to manage large amounts of data with high reliability and redundancy and a paradigm for accessing that in fast ways. Uh, there is a different paradigm of how that data will be organized and consumed by the enterprise. And there are various names that have been given to it. We, we would like to call it the data lake uh, driven modern data warehouse but that's just a naming paradigm that we chose to use and uh, identify with. It could, you know, invariably also mean an enterprise data where uh, enterprise data hub-driven warehouse or a logical data warehouse-driven uh, modern data warehouse. Um, so, in in the context of my further presentation and what I'm going to share with you, you can interchangeably use the same concepts and still end up applying. Uh, the best practices and other learnings that we've had. So data lake driven modern data warehouse, who, while it's one very important pathway to success, it's, it's kind of critical to understand what it brings uh, to the whole ecosystem uh, in, in data man management technologies for the enterprise. So the top four that we see is that, you know, very importantly, it enables self service, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. And uh, it has the ability to handle these faster uh, streaming sources of data, such as Twitter and Internet of Things and other different types of data which come at a higher velocity. And it also enables exploration, and that's one of the most critical uh, use cases, that if you have the ability to look at all the data, can you look at and imagine your use cases by doing exploratory analysis and analytics as well. Um, and then obviously a data lake driven data warehouse gives you the ability to choose your cost performance model. So it's basically like, you know, if you see uh, the image shown, there is a Toyota Prius, and a Toyota Prius can switch if you need more mileage, you know, driving habits, uh, you can switch to expensive gas or do a cheaper electric drive that's cheaper to run. So it gives you the cap capability, gives us the capability to have as a hybrid enabler in the enterprise data management technology stack. So before I move on, uh, you know, there are a variety of definitions out there, and I just wanted to take a quick minute. Um, don't want to preach about this, but, you know, let's just set the term of reference for our understanding. What is the data lake? The data lake, as we like to define it, is a massively is a massive and easily accessible, flexible, scalable data repository. And it has two very important characteristics. One of them is that it's built on an expensive computer hardware, which means that you can have commodity hardware that you can put in a cluster, and then you can end up using that. And the second is that it's designed for storing massive amounts of data. And that data could be immediately of interest that I know that you know these are things that I need to deal with. They could also be of potential interest to the enterprise that we don't know, uh, you know, that 
uh, what the exact use case might be, but we think that we can get some customer insights from maybe the social data. Uh, and it could also be the data that we don't know uh, that what we will do with it. So intended usage is not known, but we will find out. Uh, and we think we'll find out something important from it. So that's a term of reference for us, and that's what is the data lake, and that's what it brings to us. So from a capabilities perspective, what does the uh, data lake uh, brings to the enterprise that's missing or that's a gap or that comes in uh, by bringing the data lake architectures in? So there's a bunch of uh, newer capabilities that come in, but um, I would say that the four critical capabilities that the data lake architecture brings in, uh, to the enterprise data warehouse and kind of converts it into the modern data warehouse are, they're not limited, but the top four for, for us are that it creates an active ar archive. To visualize the active archive to be something that uh, it's one place where we store all, uh, stay, uh, store all our enterprise's data in any format. So it's not format constrained. So in the native format, at any scale, any volume, for as long as we like. And we allow it to address compliance requirements and also deliver data on demand to satisfy internal and external, for example, regulatory demands. Because we have put it up and secured it, in a way we can control who sees what and deliver uh, governance and lineage services and we can trace access to it and have a lineage also associated with it so that we can see what the uh, evolution of data was there uh, across the time horizon. And because it's an active archive, you know, we can see the whole version of the truth. We do not need to rely on staged, uh, you know, access channels or slower access channels. For example, if I need to get to uh, a customer's data from seven years back, it will take me a week to retrieve that. With a data lake architecture, I have the, all of that available to me all the time. The second big uh, one for us, like I spoke about in the earlier slide, as well as the self-service exploratory uh, BI. So users who frequently want to end, you know, access the enterprise's data for reporting, exploration, doing further analytical insight, production, etc., cetera, um, need all access to the data, and they generally do not get access to all this data because they are protected um, from, you know, casual access cannot be given to production systems, and many of our uh, customers and practitioners who are joining us today would realize that, you know, this is the case with every enterprise. You, they would not be getting the access to the production servers in time database, as you know. So, Having the data lake gives a access, a, a um, you know, casual access to enterprise data, so that uh, we can have users explore the data with full security, with full interactivity, and with full SQL and keyword support. And uh, the third one that we think that's the one of the other equally important capabilities that uh, is brought up by the data lake is having the ability to do advanced analytics, multiple computing frameworks, machine learning, uh, deep uh, you know learning networks could be created, which is you know the next generation of machine learning. So it could unlock new value in the data and old data sources looking at it together rather than just doing a statistic, uh, statistical sample of the data or snapshots from a short period of time or having some historical sample of the data. So rather than that, we can build models and do uh, you know, advanced analytics at scale with the whole data. Uh, the last one, but uh, equally important, uh, the capability that the data lake will bring is a capability to kind of have transformation and processing of raw data at scale in a much more cost-effective fashion. So we can uh, choose to run it in a, you know, our large, you know, our transformations in a massively parallel fashion. And uh, we can then choose uh, the placement of the workloads which transform the data. Now, if you need them to be in the, uh, you know, OLTP, you know, kind of data stores or that uh, data to be readily and, you know, very rap rapidly available, 
you know, you can put it uh, in a traditional data warehouse or if, you know, uh, you want it to be done in a more cost-effective fashion with larger sets of data, you can put them in uh, the uh, Hadoop-driven data warehouse or a data lake-driven warehouse. So uh, that gives us the benefit of lower cost of transformation and having the capability to really uh, do a cost performance analysis for running our workloads. So in Impetus, uh, we've been working uh, with a variety of customers, like you said, you know, first uh, production level uh, Hadoop use case in 2009, which was, uh, as Larry was pointing out, even a few months ahead of some of the uh, distros getting incorporated. Um, so we have realized that from all our experiences that um, there is a pattern in how one can go uh, to a successful data lake uh, driven modern data warehouse. And we have extracted that pattern and kind of staged it out and we call it the four stage uh, approach to the data lake rollout. And stage one is where we build and uh, handle the uh, ingest and master the scaling. And then we build the analytical muscle once we've got all the data in. And then we bring in the EDW and other traditional data sources and then we seamlessly create a big data platform which is delivering insights, data, information insights uh, to both customers, internal stakeholders, and everything runs in a very seamless fashion. So this is in a time sequential fashion. While we do not <clears throat> say that stage four cannot be achieved uh, by itself, when we can plan a stage four rollout and do a big bang, but it's going to take a lot of effort and time to reach that level. So that's why we, we, we propose, we strongly propose that uh, there is a stage rollout for building a data lake uh, driven uh, data warehouse. Let me uh, talk a little bit more detail quickly uh, about the four stages and what each one of them, uh, them mean. However, I'll not go into a lot of detail and I kind of just skip through and give you a glimpse of each of the stage. If you're interested in finding out more about each of these stages and what, what, what needs to happen there, from a solution approach perspective. We did a webinar in February that talked in a lot of detail about this whole journey. Uh, it's available on our website, so you could go and uh, uh, request access to that and get more insights around this journey. But just to keep the uh, focus on the topic for today, which is uh, the critical trends and considerations and inhibitors and the solution approaches for the overall enterprise uh, modern era warehouse, uh, the stage one is basically uh, the organization getting the capability to determine the existing and the new data sources that it wants to leverage, and then having them available, integrated, and ingested at high velocity, at scale, and mastering the storage and availability of that. So different type of you know uh, categories of data sources should be tied in. One, one should definitely even uh, look at streaming sources of data, so it shouldn't primarily be driven by what am I, what is available today and what will I be dealing with in phase two, but uh, the end, end goal, end feature. If there are no constraints, would I be dealing with streaming data? And if yes, then you know at least in the infrastructure one should build the ability to deal with streaming sources of data, unstructured sources of data, structured sources of data that come from different EDWs or data marts uh, uh, that exist within the enterprise. Um, you know, we can have different type of geospatial data as well and external social sources of data. So that's the whole uh, phase one architecture's focus on building uh, an efficient uh, ingest mechanism in a landing zone, so to say. You should see the next thing that happens is that if we are able to master that, uh, the use cases or the uh, value has to be driven from this data. And that's what we call building the uh, in, uh, analytical muscle. So once the data is in, a few use cases are carefully chosen and uh, the categories of use cases that we recommend that uh, you know typically are fo uh, should be focused on uh, should be of the type where there's some predictive uh, type of capabilities that are developed or enterprise applications consuming some insights that, that are getting hooked up or there are some exploration, data discovery, and data science kind of use cases that better understand the customer, better predict a churn model, for example, or reduce the fraud or, you know, optimize anything else. So these kind of use cases are put into 
uh, into uh, into the picture and they get start working over the database and we put them in production so that we can demonstrate the real value of the data lake and the power of single version of the truth. So we move on to stage three and stage three is all about uh, having uh, once we mastered the ability to do analytics over uh, a large scale and you know huge amounts of data, then we start bringing in uh, and tying together the other enterprise traditional data repositories that might exist. So more than uh, you know having extracts and being fed through the landing and ingestion phase, could there be more seamless types of use cases that actually become a part of the data lake strategy and you know this is the foundation where we lay out the modern data warehouse and this is the most critical of uh, of the more, uh, of the four stages because if you see the stage one and two are basically proving out the capability of Hadoop this is where we prove out that the data lake driven modern data warehouse is actually a, a very important perspective so once we are able to do that in this real world scenario, what we move on to then is what we call the stage four. And in stage four, once we are able to handle all of these things and have the foundation of everything, we strengthen and lay another foundation of governance that uh, works across, seamlessly across the traditional data sources as well as the enterprise data lake. Uh, the information lifecycle is synchronized and works across. The enterprise meta model and management is done across, so there is one seamless single source of data that exists and a single fabric of, uh, of uh, information flow and information consumption that's driven by the traditional data sources and the data lake being uh, you know, disseminated through the organization. Gartner says that by 2018 of all the people, and you know one other statistic that they're sharing is that um, by 2018, most of the enterprises will have a data lake or a logical data warehouse uh, kind of a strategy in play, or they'll be forced to adopt one. And they're also saying that 90% of the deployed data lakes will be useless as they are overwhelmed with information assets captured for uncertain use cases. I think what Gartner is predicting is based on where we stand today, which is still you know 2015 and. Uh, the way the implementations are happening. So what is it, you know, further, you know, in the next few slides I would like to present, what is it that separates these 90% of the data lakes which are doomed for failure and the modern data warehouse that is doomed for failure versus the 10% that is going to be successful and these are enterprises that will be way more powerfully successful in their business, will eat up the competition and will be massively creating value for themselves and their customers. So let me start off, and in, in no order of priority, the first one that you know I would like to share that the biggest difference is that um, as we evolve towards the stage four big data lake driven uh, warehouse, it's pretty much going to be a uh, big data as a platform or data as a platform or data as a service that's going to happen. And for all the enterprise users, the critical aspect will be that insights and data have to be readily available. They have to be discoverable, accessible, and usable. If we are able to master this and we are able to provide this in our data lake and as a capability, this is going to be one of the critical success factors. You know, as the in increasing amount of data is ingested at scale and is put into the data lake, What's going to happen is users are not going to know what you know happened at a point in time. They have to be made known or they have to be given a channel through which they can discover what different types of data is available in the data lake. They could do it through searching, they could do it through you know finding entities and other things or canned queries and whatnot. So this capability has to happen. And discovery can happen both on data and on context. So that, that's something that, you know, very interesting because generally we look at the uh, data itself and uh, the context but not the services, how data is getting con uh, consumed and other things. So if we give the full use, uh, you know, discoverability to all of these things, users will find uses for data to be used in different kind of use cases. 
And when they find uh, something that they are interested in, they should be given uh, access to it immediately so that they can uh, build something with it. They can, uh, you know, do something and prove or result in some business value getting added to the organization. And all of this has to happen within the bounds of governance. It's not like it's a giant data swamp out there that anybody and everybody and their dog and their, you know, uh, family members get access to all of that data. It is with full governance, security, the governed channel of access. They can see what they can see, but they can continually see what is available and they can use it. Now, discoverability and accessibility has to go hand in hand because otherwise there will be no usability in that data. If you make it discoverable and uh, if it's not accessible timely or not accessible immediately or through the channel that the users wanted, uh, they, can, they can find it, but they can have, they'll have frustrated experience of not being able to use it. So one builds on each other, but then the whole use case is they have to go hand in hand. The next critical success factor, and if you're planning for success, is uh, the fact that the data in lake has to be smart. And uh, I've, when I say that, a lot of people know what smart data is, but I do get asked a lot about, you know, what does smart data mean? I mean, is there smartness in data, and what, what's that going to do? So how do I define it? I define it as the opposite. So smart data is everything that, let's say, dumb data is not. And what is dumb data? Dumb data is hard to find uh, because uh, if you work with traditional uh, dumb data, you need to know the exact location of a particular piece of information. You need to know the key to access that data. You cannot access it without knowing a particular primary database or a customer ID or something like that. If it's hard to find, you cannot use it. Same employee ID could be different IDs in three different data mart. So, you know, it's kind of very hard to find. It's hard to understand. What does it mean hard to understand? So if you do not know what that data means, for example, uh, you know, in some context, uh, customer name might be stored as customer's first name or last name, and in some context it is stored as uh, name, and in some other context it's stored as something. And the whole logic of how that data is used is built into the application. Uh, only applications understand the data. But the data, if you look at the data, you have to look at so many other artifacts, data schemas, design documents, to even get the co to comprehend what that data means, let alone use it. And that you know comes to the third one, which is it's hard to combine. It's hard to combine because it's hard to find and it's hard to un understand. If you're not able to combine it with other data sources, then you will not be able to derive new sorts of value. So if smart data is all that dumb data is not, it is easy to find, it is easy to understand, and it is easy to combine with other sources of data, then what would smart data have to do and have? You know, these are uh, the two critical aspects that we propose that uh, smart data should have. One is that it should contain its meaning. It should be self-describing which means that uh, you should be able to have as much meaning associated with it and the second is it should also have its context. And the context doesn't mean, uh, you know, the metadata itself, but, you know, the, you know, context also means how it gets used. For example, uh, at one particular customer, we treat the metadata also as data. So metadata changing over a period of time and the different versions of metadata tell a lot about the context of how the data is getting used. Um, and smart data also, because it's going to be interoperating outside of the enterprises, tends to be ontology-driven, like taxonomy-driven, or industry standard-driven sometimes, or sometimes technology standard-driven as well, uh, that, that can allow us to make it searchable and discoverable. So if I move on to the third critical uh, success factor that's going to differentiate um, the, uh, a good successful data lake strategy from uh, uh, the one that doesn't uh, succeed, I think uh, we have to rethink the whole information plumbing that exists within the organization. Uh, if you look at and uh, recollect from slide number four, uh, a slide about stage four and stage three, it was all about building a seamless experience with the traditional sources of data, other data mart and other sources of data that already exist. ETL is one of the most critical ways uh, that was 
has been in use and investments have been made for loading and transforming, uh, transforming data into the warehouse for business intelligence, insights, and other report and dashboard creation. Um, if we have to use the same type of processing and processes to uh, move the data around at big data scale, it's going to be very costly and it's also going to be very cumbersome uh, with the size and velocity of the uh, data that we have at hand. Um, so what, what needs to happen is that we need to really rethink a different variety of lightweight data blending tools that allow users to blend their own recipe, their own version of a smoothie of the data that exists with the data, different data sets in the enterprise, of course, in a fully governed and secure way with uh, you know, deciding what, uh, what sources of data and what uh, actual aspects of data they have access to. But they can play around and wrangle around with the data to test out hypotheses and other things for cases where business cannot wait. If business can wait, you can go through the traditional ETL, IT systems, you know, processing. But if business just cannot wait and things need to happen as of yesterday, you know, these kind of tools are an imperative. And this is what is going to differentiate uh, a successful enterprise uh, modern data warehouse from an unsuccessful one. The next one uh, and the last one before I move on is uh, self-service BI capability. Uh, I think this is one of the most important ones that uh, will be differentiating uh, what will actually a successful uh, big data-driven uh, big data-driven warehouse, modern warehouse, will deliver to the end users. If we are able to successfully have a self-service user experience, which is simple, beautiful, and works. Uh, business users are going to, you know, really uh, use the data that exists in the uh, in the data lake. They would find different uses very simply, and hence, you know, it will stop it from becoming a data swamp. So basically, you know, putting the anal uh, power of analytics in the hands of end users to create their own reports, analytics, with the data sense they want, uh, on an as-needed basis, on a scheduled basis. Uh, basically, the goal is to utilize the you know data wrangling, blending capabilities, and other capabilities to reduce the IT's involved, uh, IT department's involvement, and expedite information from systems to business users uh, by delivering uh, you know I'm using a Gartner term uh, here faster, more user-friendly, or more relevant BI, right? With with the single version of the truth. One of the things I said was, uh, you know, IT department and business do not, it's, it's kind of generally seen uh, as a divided world and, you know, they, you know, throw across artifacts and they do not really collaborate. Uh, this is an evolutionary paradigm in which the IT department actually takes on a different role. It really gets to play the enabler here rather than be under duress to deliver, right? In the traditional paradigm, IT departments have to deliver to the specs of the uh, business users, and that's where the whole divide ends up and start, starts up and ends up being. They, here they can play the enabler. They can enable reinforced governance, structure user autonomy, account for user differentiation, give users access to the data sets they really want, focus on managing the single version of the truth, and then let the users decide what they want to do with the data because the IT department may not be so well connected and well entrenched with the business users or understand the lay of the business landscape such that you know they can they can do things with the data. Business users can use the data to do interesting things, test out hypotheses, do machine learning, you know, create new models to do a lot of use cases. So this is a hybrid approach that we are proposing, and uh, this is one of the most critical uh, paradigm shifts that will determine the success of uh, the whole uh, paradigm. Then I'll move on, and I uh, present that Impetus has you know, already done a lot of work in this area. We have a proven approach. We have uh, what we call the dilemma solution approach uh, to resolve the dilemma of uh, really putting across a very powerful simple, workable, uh, massively successful 
modern data warehouse into an enterprise's capability. And uh, with the dilemma, uh, dilemma, what it stands for is that on the data side, uh, how to handle the ingestion, storage, governance, security, compliance issues, pro and strategies and solutions to handle that with any of the Hadoop distributions being the underlying infrastructure, uh, the information lifecycle management on the lineage side, et cetera, the enterprise meta management model with ontology driven metadata discovery strategies, et cetera, and the access where query performance and having the ability to search what kinds of data are available being critical. With that, Larry, I would uh, hand over to you uh, to summarize and uh, talk about the next steps. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, audience, again, for giving us the opportunity uh, to, to present this to you. Obviously, this is just uh, one of the introductory uh, series, and Larry will take us through what, what else is coming. Great, Vineet, and thank you again for that great summary of uh, where we're headed here in this uh, five-part series. Uh, you'll see on the screen here in a minute, and there you go, the other four webinars which we have teed up to elaborate what Vineet has laid out today on September 25th, and they'll all be at the same time uh, on a Friday. Uh, the next one will be Friday, September 25th, and we'll cover the top five ways to access big data, hitting on some very hot topics like SQL on Hadoop, OLAP and BI on Hadoop, and what is the, the current state of the uh, different uh, solutions that are available for uh, each of those and bring in uh, some uh, relationship to data virtualization, another important uh, topic being talked a lot about today, and how can we can support the kind of discovery and search that Vanit has said will be one of the keys to making sure that we're successful in our big data warehouse implementations. You see the other three topics listed here. The next two also relate directly to opening up access to users in a, in a, in a uh, easy to use uh, fashion. Uh, next uh, one on October 9th uh, after uh, uh, Hadoop World at Strata, which is uh, next week. Uh, data democratization, unlocking the true potential of the data wake will be on October 9th. Again, they're all on Fridays at uh, 10 uh, Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern, and you see some of the topics that we'll be uh, get into here, which we've talked about a little bit today, the importance of not just creating a productive environment for exploration, but being able to also apply advanced analytics while maintaining uh, governance and security. The third in the, or the, actually what would be the fourth now, but the, the third from now, approaches to self-service BI on Hadoop. Uh, Vanit has talked about several, kind of introduced several of the concepts there which we'll be expanding on when we talk about uh, BI and uh, cubes on Hadoop as well as data blending capabilities. And lastly, we'll finish with the whole concept uh, or the whole topic of uh, investment protection, leveraging the in some cases, easily two decades of investments in various data warehouse infrastructure today, how we can uh, automate some of the migration of that and keeping in consideration the impact on people and process. So that's what the uh, series looks like. Uh, thank you again for today. We'd like to move now to uh, a focus on uh, answering some of the questions that have come in. There are another, uh, there are a number of those and uh, let me just uh, read these off. Need I think you have these as well. I'll ask you to jump in and start with a recommendation on using Hive versus HBase as well as real-time versus batch uh, data repositories. Sure, Larry. And I um, uh, just wanted to check a quick time check on where we are, and we don't have much time remaining for today's webinar. Uh, so let me pick up a few of the uh, questions that have come up and uh, that I can uh, perhaps address for today. Uh, one of them has been the recommendation on using high versus HBase real-time batch kind of data repositories. And uh, this is something that we keep running into all the time, and the way I like to look at it is that, you know, while the data lake is a single version of truth, it's the enterprise's repository of all the data is there. Um, look at it from a Lambda architecture perspective. There are different types of things that the enterprise has to do. If there are streaming sources of data uh, which are coming in, maybe from OLTP data sources, maybe some transactions as they're happening, 
if you need to do analytics while the data is streaming in and then persist it in the data lake for future use, there is a pattern that can be implemented. Uh, and also a use case where once the data has come in, maybe from other sources, you can mix it with the other remaining sources of data and then produce deeper insights, for example. Now, the data lake has to suffice uh, both of these kind of workloads. It doesn't, uh, uh, it is not a binary one or the other. It's not like, you know, you can only do high-based, long-running queries or an edge-based kind of uh, real-time. I think with the data lake capability, we, we, we have proven and we have uh, demonstrated that depending on the workloads, you can have the same uh, single version of the truth and uh, we can do deeper analytics on bigger sources of data, which are longer running queries, and we can do a shorter bursts of analytics on very fastly arriving data as well. So both of these are possible with the data lake architecture. Uh, there's another question somebody asked said, uh, in the context of self-service data, what is uh, distinct between discoverable and accessible? Uh, both seem to be similar. Uh, yes and no. I, I think uh, even from the uh, literal meaning, they're different. And what I actually mean in the context of the data lake architecture, discoverability is the element of if there are 40 data sets that reside in the data um, uh, lake, for example, you know, customer records, transaction records by year or by month is one type of data. Customers' addresses and other, you know, demographic things are another set of data. So all of these, uh, uh, having the ability for somebody to, you know, kind of know and go and find what is there, you know, discover them not by looking at the HDFS files and directories and trying to make sense from it, but from a semantic perspective, having the ability to go to the data lake, maybe a layer on top of that and say, tell me what is there in the data lake about customers. And we'll tell, you know, you can discover that these are transaction logs and there are demographic data sets and whatnot. So that's discoverability. And accessibility is, once I've discovered this, uh, having the ability to then also access them you know, as I need them. Accessibility also means services, you know, different algorithms that work on the data, such that I can get access to the context of the data. I can get the services uh, that deliver uh, some of these insights as well. So that's another one, and um, I think we're a little over time here. So uh, I'll end here, Larry, and uh, for the rest of the questions, uh, we will uh, definitely email back with, with the answers. Absolutely. We also would ask you to take a minute here at the close and rate your experience here today, and that will help us uh, to plan and make sure that the follow-on uh, uh, webinars in the series uh, deliver, uh, you know, just uh, great information in a great format. So if you'll take a minute to do that, you'll see a, a rating uh, from one to five, and you also have the ability there to enter comments and feedback. Very important that you take a minute as we close to give us uh, your feedback on that. And I would re-summarize that any questions that did not get answered live on the air today will be uh, compiled and sent out to everyone attending today. And lastly, I want to thank you for attending and uh, let you know that you can contact us uh, at bigdata at impetus.com. Obviously, we're doing a lot of work with a lot of large enterprises in, in a v wide range uh, of industries, assisting them on building and being successful with their big data implementations. And if you will be attending Strat Strata Hadoop World at the Javits Center in New York next week, we will be exhibiting there. Would love to meet you face to face and also look forward to you participating in in the remaining four uh, webinars in the series. Thank you again for your time today and have a, a great weekend.